Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Circle of Fellows, episode number 14. Uh, this is a monthly broadcast slash podcast where four IABC fellows and I uh, convene to discuss the IABC editorial theme of the month. And this month, that theme is the impact of social media on the practice of public relations. And I'll, I'll read you exactly what that description is from the IABC editorial board. Uh, what does PR practice look like in an age in which the death of the press release is widely discussed? I think we'll talk about that, whether the death of the press release is a real thing. Uh, this episode of Circle of Fellows explores how to identify influencers among journalists and other media professionals who cover your industry and build ongoing relationships with them through social media channels like Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, and we'll also address other changes to uh, social media, uh, other changes to the PR in the wake of social media. Uh, the panel today uh, is uh, all present and accounted for, and uh, we'll go around the table, uh, the virtual table, so they can introduce themselves, starting with, uh, I'm gonna, just going to go in the order in which the thumbnails appear on my screen, and that's Alice first. Hi, Alice. Hi, Jill. Nice to be here. I am an independent public relations consultant, primarily focusing on the energy industry, and um, at one of the newest fellows. That's right. And you do have agency background as well. I do. I have agency and corporate backgrounds. Great. And uh, next on my screen is Brad Whitworth. Hey, Shell and Alice and company. Wanted to uh, say hello. My name is Brad Whitworth. I have been hanging out in Northern California for the last uh, 35 years doing um, tech communications, both internal and external. Um, Cisco, HP, a company called PeopleSoft that's now part of Oracle. So um, social media is uh, no stranger to this part of the world, and its impact, I think, is often felt starting in Silicon Valley. Wonderful. And uh, next on uh, my thumbnail order is, is Christopher Bunting. Hi, Chris. Good morning, Shell, and good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Bunting, and I'm in Toronto. Uh, <clears throat> at present, I'm the uh, president of the Canadian Foundation for AIDS Research, which is a uh, medical research foundation. Uh, in the past, I spent a number of years as the CEO of Weber Shanwick, uh, the public relations agency in Canada and then a decade in the United Kingdom where I was running a, uh, a public relations firm there, Global Consulting, uh, which has since become part of the, the Grayling Group. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, really happy to have you, Chris, uh, especially given this topic. Uh, I thought it was important to have somebody who spent a, a lot of time in the agency world to talk about this. Uh, and uh, last but definitely not least, just in the order of my thumbnails, is Marianne McCauley. Good morning. Pleasure to be with all of you. This should be a really interesting discussion. My background includes being a newspaper reporter back in the days of hot types, so I'm dating myself a little bit. So I've got corporate experience, agency experience. I am, like Alice, an independent consultant. I uh, have <clears throat> focused uh, a lot in high tech when I was in Minnesota. I'm now in Reno, Nevada. And as this part of my career, I'm beginning to focus almost exclusively on nonprofits, helping them communicate better. So, and they're greatly affected by social media these days. Terrific. And I want to let those watching, we do have a number of people watching live, uh, that you can ask questions. The way to do that is to tweet them with the hashtag COF14, COF14 for Circle of Fellows, episode 14. So hashtag COF14. I'll reiterate that a couple of times as people join the viewing audience, but let's get started. Um, and since the IABC description of the editorial theme of the month starts off by talking about the death of the press release, when, when we talk about social media's impact on the practice of PR, to what extent has it actually eliminated older practices like the press release. In, in my experience, the press release remains a pretty vital and useful, uh, if overused and misused tool. Well, I would agree with that, Shell. I don't think the press release is dead. It has a, it has a place. It's particularly useful, I've noticed, in a smaller market like, like Reno. Um, 
I read things in the newspaper that I know are verbatim out of the news release. I also think the news release serves anymore as more backgrounder to uh, the many media outlets we use, whether they be the print, television, radio, or if they're in a social media channel. They, they give the person you're sending it to some background about the issues that you're wanting to discuss. Yeah, I think in the olden days, uh, the press release was the news announcement, and it was a big deal. When was the release going to go out? And we don't really operate in that way anymore, I think. No. Well, I, 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 sure, go ahead, Brad. Oh, let's go with Chris. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I, I would agree with what everybody said. I think the uh, the press release is certainly not dead. I think the application of the press release has changed significantly. And there are still some areas, um, some industries where press releases are, are a requirement. In the financial industry, for example, when you're dealing with stock markets, um, press releases are a regulatory requirement in, in, in most, most places. Uh, the same with the medical industry. If you're if you're dealing with very precise medical information, the press release is still um, uh, is still a, re a required format. Um, but on a broader base, I think dealing with with clients and even from my perspective now running a, a charity, um, the press release it's still a one of the primary tools in our toolbox. Uh, but the application of it uh, has has changed notably. Well, my point is going to be that I think the press release before, it was the only way to get things out. I mean, it, it right. was the channel, and we had to rely upon all sorts of, you know, whether it was print on the newspaper side, magazine, we had to time our work to match the schedules of those that we were relying upon to actually get the word out. What we've been able to do with press releases, quite honestly, is cut out the middleman. The journalists are one part of the equation, but there's also this tremendous opportunity to be able to go directly to the consumers of the information without having to necessarily um, be beholden to the publishing schedule, the you know the t dates that uh, the you know, the broadcast people are working with, and the timelines. So it really has changed things from uh, sort of a on their schedule to uh, let's figure out the optimum time to do this and recognizing it could be a 24 by seven news cycle. Mm -hmm. The uh, press release, as, as you say, Brad, used to be the only way to get news out. We relied on the filter of the, the press. Uh, that's not true anymore. So in fact, the whole idea of earned media has, has changed. Who do you earn it from? Uh, you know, among marketers, we've, we've heard a lot of chatter about the importance of working with influencers because they have higher levels of credibility than uh, your own spokespeople within the organization. In fact, I've seen a couple of studies that tout very high return on investment from influencers compared to other means of, of, of reaching people with information. Uh, any any thoughts on, on the use of influencers as an alternative or as a supplement to the mainstream press? I think it's, I'm trying to think of a specific example and um, <clears throat> one that I've got in, here in Houston, I work with a nonprofit, uh, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we wanted to get a story out and we called the local, um, I actually emailed, just regular old email, the <laughs> local radio uh, talk show and said, you know, we've got this, this idea, we've got, we've got somebody, <clears throat> but I can also recommend to you three other spokespeople who can present points of view on this. And so those influencers became part of the story. And then, you know, it, as they, followed up with their own social media and the radio station followed up with its social media, then it spread further. Yeah, I had a, a client, and this is going back before the term influencer marketing was a thing, uh, but it was Encyclopedia Britannica, and uh, they realized that Wikipedia was eating their lunch and they wanted to uh, become a resource to bloggers and website publishers 
so that you could link to an authoritative uh, Britannica article rather than a Wikipedia article. And in the outreach that we did, which was uh, a, uh, a an offer they had that if you were a blogger or a site owner, you'd get a free account. And if you use the right kind of link, your readers could get into that article without being a paying member, uh, a paying subscriber to uh, Britannica. And the way we went about it was not looking for A-listers. It was looking for the A-listers within very small niches online. Uh, if you remember Technorati, we, we used Technorati to identify who the top bloggers were uh, among journalists, among academics, uh, and, and there was uh, among library science professionals, because these were people who generally, we were told, don't use Wikipedia. It's too unreliable a resource. So, uh, you know, they were A-listers in a very small pond, uh, but nobody anybody else had heard of. And uh, by having them talk about it, uh, we got something like 20,000 people sign up for this thing. And I, I said, hmm, I think everybody's on to something here with, with going out through the, the bloggers. Yeah. Uh, who, who wield influence over their communities. Yeah. I think one of the other things we have to bear in mind, and it sort of builds upon what Marianne said, is to think of the dynamics at the receiving end of things, the newspaper, you know, newsroom, or the radio station, or what have you. Um, those people are strapped in terms of time, in terms of resources, and, um, you know, often a press release, if it's, you know, decently constructed, just sort of be picked up and run as is, because they don't have time to um, re-edit things and assemble them and do things. And I find that particularly true in some of the trade publications when I'm reading them. It looks as if, you know, they, rather than have a reporter go and dig and try to figure out exactly what do they mean by this, you know, what is this, and adding, I'll call it adding any value above and beyond what's in the release, they run it verbatim. So there still is, I'll say, a market for it, but it's a different market than before. Uh, I think the, you know, the publications and the broadcast media and, you know, certainly the online media that are doing their job, if it's heavy duty enough, they'll send a reporter, they'll figure out a way to write that story to uh, build on it. And they'll often call on those influencers that you were talking about, Shell. So I think we need to expand our universe of the, who gets this information and then how do we expect it to be used and consumed and transmitted through those direct channels and even the indirect channels? Uh, I, I was speaking with a reporter last week with, with this uh, discussion today in time, and I asked her about, about uh, how things have changed in her 15-year career. And she said, well, uh, when she started out um, as a broadcast journalist, she said, I, I, I spent most of my time outside of the studio, outside of the newsroom. Um, and she said, the reverse is true today. I'm spending most of my time uh, in the newsroom. I'm working electronically. Uh, we certainly do not go to press conferences. I mean, rarely will I go to a press conference unless it's something absolutely huge. Um, but we're relying on all kinds of, of other uh, 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 media or other forms of media to, to, to get information. And um, the relationships are always at the base of everything you do. But uh, how those relationships are established and, and how those are the people that you trust, the sources you trust, uh, still very important. How they're established is different from before. Do organizations still hold press conferences? I hear about them so rarely. <laughs> they, they, I think I'm less is better. For 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> well, to me, they were a dead issue a long time ago. I think the press conference still has one key purpose, and that's in crisis situations. Yeah. I think, you know, in a crisis situation, you do need to get your information, you know, in one place uh, with one single story to all the media, and the press really press conference is still the best way to do that. I actually wanted to do a media boot camp, um, actually on the same topic of mental illness, and realized that nobody would come. And so we did a virtual boot camp. We sent out a kit with all the information that we thought people would need. Well, and what we've also found at Cisco to be true is that you can invite journalists to some key events that you're already holding and make them a part of the regular audience, as well as some of the influencers and some of the uh, analysts who uh, track the industry. So instead of holding a separate thing to announce it, you may do it for a group of customers or a group of dealers or, you know, you name the primary audience, and you can include journalists. Sometimes they'll even add sort of barnacle meetings for the journalists to let them have an opportunity to do in-depth interviews with other executives who may not necessarily be part of the announcement. So I think there are other ways to involve journalists. Yeah. Um, and they don't doesn't necessarily have to be an exclusive 
for them for the launch or the introduction of XYZ. Yeah, yeah it's a, a good point, Brad. And it also, I think, brings up the issue that faces those of us doing media relations back as, as Alice referred to the, the, the olden days, you had a choice of, is this print, is it television, is it radio, uh, or what combination. Now you're dealing with multiple combinations. Where does it go? Who does it go to? Does it go directly to those influencers through their blogs and, and their own channels? So that you have to be very savvy about what channels are available and who your audiences are going to for information. It was a lot easier 10, 15 years ago, <laughs> even. And today, I, don't know, I, I don't know that it was easier. I think it was narrower, but right now what we have is we actually have more control in some ways. That's true. Yeah. Because we don't have to, you know, if we don't have the gatekeeper of that daily newspaper, um, if they don't run the story, then it doesn't get to a broad audience. Now we have no, ways doesn't. to get around those gatekeepers as well as to continue to build the relationships with those gatekeepers. And I think that one of the things we haven't talked about is that social media is a great way to nurture those relationships with the, with the traditional media. Yes. Yes. I think well, that's true. And I think the journalists are taking a full advantage of social media. Um, I've been approached by a Washington Post reporter not that long ago um, who sort of had found my background up on uh, LinkedIn and elsewhere and knew that I knew something about a topic that uh, would lead to a story that she was researching. So it's sort of like, the, hey, you know, who do you know that I could talk to about this, that, and the other and found me through social media. The other one that just is so interesting to me is uh, my friend who's the sports editor at the San Jose Mercury News had been using social media to crowdsource headlines so he has the following and um, this last year when the San Jose Sharks were fortunate enough to make it to the uh, Stanley Cup playoffs after having never been in the finals the headline was actually crowdsourced and it was finally only it was F-I-N as in shark fin in teal the team color and A-L-L-Y in black ink and it came from the people who were sort of one eye on the television screen and the other eye on the second screen following and talking to Bud. Some of the headlines that didn't get used were um, fun to look at too. So you really felt as if you were a part of the production of the what you were going to see tomorrow morning on your doorstep for those who still subscribe and can read newspapers. Newspapers, <laughs> <laughs> Brad. Mine's pretty skinny here in Reno, but I like to hold it in my hand every morning while I also read a, a lot of things online. You know, a topic we haven't talked about, maybe I'm getting ahead of you, Shell, is the whole idea of how we pitch stories today. Yes. You know, <clears throat> we, we used to offer a story idea to one or two, maybe three outlets. Sometimes we'd offer what was called a sidebar. Today we know that with the way reporters repurpose stories, that we need to have more than one lead often to a single source where we might have had multiple lead angles to multiple sources. Now we need multiple leads to single source so that we can get a human interest angle. We can get a factual angle. We can get, you know, another so that it, um, it really makes our job more challenging, but in a lot of ways, a lot more fun because we have the opportunity to look at a, any given topic in a variety of different ways and offer it to a single source in a lot of different ways. So when you're saying a single source, you're meaning a particular reporter who might also blog about it or who might also um, run a quick YouTube piece or something like that? Yes, yes. And you don't uh want to offer them one topic to repurpose those, say, those three different ways if you can offer them, well, for example, with with your mental illness organization, maybe a, a YouTube piece on an individual and then another piece on the more <coughs> issue of mental illness. Mm -hmm. uh, you've, you've got the topic covered in, in a lot of different ways that will appeal to audiences in different ways. Yeah. And it, it, it's on, on the same thing, it's formatting. Uh, uh, talking to re many reporters who, who uh, um, are covering 
different platforms. I mean, they're, they're, if they're writing for a print publication, they're doing that. Then they have to write for their website. Then they might have to produce a YouTube, as you just mentioned. Yeah. So it's providing mm -hmm. information that is compatible with, with the different platforms that they're working with. Yes. yes. In fact, making their job easier, as Brad was talking yeah. earlier. As That's easy as possible. The they are for time. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm reminded a little bit of a, and, and Shell probably remembers this, you probably all did, in um, the book that talked about the future of communications, uh, Clue Train Manifesto, written more than a decade ago. I do remember the discussion of a press release, and it's sort of like no self-respecting editor would ever take a press release as was written and insert it in his publication, which is what we wanted to have happen. And he said it was, uh, he, he said, something close to obscene about a you know a journalist would probably stick something else in a body cavity rather than insert a press release that, and, and this make-believe prose that we would try to do that sounded as if it were a story but were not quite and so I think one of the things that I have seen happen a lot lately and I know Cisco has done it many many other companies are calling what I call deconstructed press releases oh. where it's more um, fact sheet <coughs> excuse me lots of bullets Somebody go on. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we called that a social media news release for a while. This was a popular idea. Shift Communications came up with the idea after <coughs> Ramsky, who is a tech journalist, uh, wrote a post called Die Press Release, Die, Die, Die. Uh, and his interest wasn't actually in killing the press release. It was in making it useful for a reporter who existed online. Uh, he said, break the quotes out in a quote section, break the facts out in bullets, uh, let me cherry pick the parts. He says, your job isn't to write my story, that's my job. You should be making it easy for me, uh, not burying information and all that flowery prose, but allowing me to go through and cut and paste the quotes I want to use and the facts I want to use and uh, you know, the boilerplate I want to use. Uh, he said, let me get to bed earlier. Uh, <laughs> was his point. And for a, for a number of years, we talked about it. Shift went through three iterations of the social media news release, uh, one version one, version two, and version, I think it was 2.5 uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, what I see today, nobody's talking about the social media news release, but a lot of organizations, that's just the way they do their news releases now. Not the ones that are going out over Business Wire and PR Newswire and Canada Newswire and the like, but uh, the ones that appear online, they have the images ready for download uh, and, and use in the piece. They have the video ready for embedding. Uh, and, and all of those components that make it easy for a reporter who's producing content for an online publication to pick and choose the pieces they want to appear in that piece. Mm -hmm. We're certainly seeing that around the Cisco side of things, and I think it, uh, I was going to supplement that with the, the other trend that sort of adds the complexity to all of this, which is we're now having the um, social media ambassadors that companies will train to be able to do some of what it is that, um, you know, had been the you know, exclusive purview of those in corporate communications. So often, you know, a company will produce, here's a story and here's a great graphic, go out and put it on your social media and um, you know see if it gets picked up by those who are in your circle and sometimes the people you know are working in a, a tech area or an area of specialization and their followers love picking this stuff up and and it gets just as much spread as it you know might through some of the more traditional um, outlets that we had probably historically relied upon. So by deconstructing this stuff, by having the video clip, by having a little chart, by having a series of quotes, by having maybe even a prepackaged story, and then you're allowed to put your comments on top of it, it's accomplishing much of the same thing. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Now, I, I have said for, for many years that new media don't kill old media, old media adapt. And uh, I think for those who would suggest that the press release is dead, uh, they need to take a look at uh, trade journals and weekly newspapers that need to fill space between ads and don't have the staff to write original content for all that. These press releases show up in all different kinds of places. Uh, so I, I think there's still utility in a basic text release that goes out over the wire, don't you? I think, I think it does get picked up. I think we need to go back to what are our objectives, who is our audience, all of the basics, and say, you know, what, what audience is, is this for, and how does that audience um, 
treat this this kind of stuff so yeah. the, the audience being the media that you're reaching out to um, you know if you're if you are reaching out to a trade publication or you're reaching out to a, a weekly newspaper or the community the community section of the Houston Chronicle um, picks up the press releases verbatim if they are well done and um, we've been been very uh, fortunate with some of those that kind of coverage yeah. but we also um, know that some publications won't and so it's all about understanding who that channel is that you're going to reach out through. Well, let's take a question because it's uh, right along the lines of the topic that you introduced Marianne. Uh, Brian Kilgore, a regular viewer of Circle of Fellows, uh, wants to know about building relationships with journalists through social media uh, and he's, he's looking for real-world examples that you may have. Uh, I'd like to share, you know, before we jump into that, first I want to let everybody watching know that you can submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag COF14, COF14. Uh, but I've talked to a number of people in agency land who, what they do is is they, they find the journalists who are writing about the topics mm -hmm. or uh, that their clients are are dealing with, and there are a number of different uh, tools that you can use for that. Muckrack is is one of them. Um, there's a, a, a Twitter directory where you can search for journalists and then find out what they're writing about. Uh, and then what they'll start doing is following those journalists and participating in conversations that were not necessarily related to the client work they were doing. They were offering insight uh, and resources and links and building the relationship so that the journalists started paying attention to that PR practitioner so that when that PR practitioner came back and said, I have something that you may be interested in, the journalist said, uh, all right, I know you, you've been sharing valuable information that hasn't been for the benefit of your client. I think I'll pay attention to this because I, I suspect it's going to be useful and relevant. Uh, is, is that the type of relationship building that, that you've encountered, particularly on Twitter, which is, let's face it, the social network that most journalists have embraced as uh, both a means of uh, engaging with uh, the stories they're writing, but also uh, in promoting their stories, because the clicks are so important to the publishers, um, sure. promoting their stories in that, you know, Twitter's come right out and said, we believe we are the real-time social news source. Absolutely, I think it's it's all of the above, and it's it's also it's it's retweeting what reporters are are tweeting out. It is uh, uh, sending them information, tweeting out information from your own organization, as you pointed out, Shell. Whether it is uh, directly uh, relevant or beneficial to your client or to your own organization, but that it's going to help the uh, uh, the reporter, um, as I say, retweeting all of those things. I think are a part of establishing that kind of relationship. Something we've done both with clients when I was in London and, and we do in this organization here is we use probably more than we did before, often established through social media, but we offer exclusives. Uh, so we decide this is, this is the content of our press release. If we target reporter X, um, the chance of this being picked up with the support of social media all around it, um, we are probably going to reach more people uh, than if we do a, a, broad, uh, a broad brush stroke. So, um, all of that stemming from the from the basic use of, of Twitter and re establishing those relationships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think it's also a way to get in early. If you know, if the journalists you know post on Twitter that they are uh, researching a story on such and such and looking for sources, and you find those and follow up. Well, I always find it ironic that uh, companies, agencies are always looking to hire a new person in the media relations space that has all of these wonderful contacts, you know, bring me all of this whole set of contacts. And, um, you know, if you don't have contacts in the business, they, they don't want you. What they don't realize sometimes is there's tremendous turnover in the journalism side of things. I mean, publications are going out of business, staffs are shrinking, newspapers are folding. And so that list of people that you had has a half-life, and I don't know what the half-life is, but I'm guessing it's probably less than a year. Um, what I've found more important, at least uh, than what I've been trying to do, is make friends with people. You know, I have on my Facebook and my LinkedIn, a lot of the journalists that I've worked with, you know, people from 
the LA Times, the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, Business Week bureau chief, a lot of them, and I follow what it is that they're doing and when they're writing about their kids and you comment about it. It's like almost getting to know a journalist the way you would get to know, you know, a coworker who you know might be across the hall or down the street or in another country by showing a personal interest and in understanding what sort of ticks in their life as well as what it is that Chris was talking about in terms of what they're writing and what they're developing. I think we stand a much better chance sometimes of um, building those relationships. It's just a, a different way of doing it. And so I, I think it can be a little bit deeper than just the, uh, you know, arm's length will send you a press release and hope that you follow up on it, which was almost like applying to a blind newspaper ad from X number of years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that, you know, social media provides the digital equivalent of going out for a drink with a reporter, which I, I believe was done in the distant, distant past. Or lunch. Yeah. Or lunch. Mm -hmm. You're talking <laughs> Mad Men now. <laughs> oh, I, I, I did that in the uh, the 80s and, and 90s. Uh, it's not that long ago. <laughs> but yeah, Brad, you raise an interesting point when you talk about the number of papers that are going out of business. Uh, I, I still get the uh, daily newspaper here, the East Bay Times, part of the Bay Area News Group. That includes uh, the San Jose Mercury News, probably the, the biggest of uh, the, the papers they own. Um, the business section now appears on the back page of the sports section. Uh, and if you no. go backwards, the jumps are on the inside back page. Uh, it, it, it used to be just one page next to the obits. But when I moved here, uh, it was uh, anywhere from four to eight pages during the week and maybe 16 on Sunday, uh, its own section. The reason it has shrunk is that the ad revenue isn't there to support it, and they don't have the business reporters to fill it with content. So whereas... You know, when I moved to the Bay Area in, in the early 90s, there were probably 15, 20 stories daily. Uh, now there are seven or eight. Uh, there are fewer opportunities to get these stories placed in the mainstream press. So where do you go, given social media is the reason, and digital media is the reason that all this has happened, uh, how do you use social media to get these stories told? these days. Uh, I mean, I have my thoughts, but I'd, I'd love to hear yours. And, and Chris, I'd, I'd love to know what you're doing in, in your organization to you know, fill the gap that has been left by the shrinkage of the press. Well, one thing we do is, is uh, <clears throat> and it can only be used in certain instances, but it does come up every, every so often, and that is just anticipating stories where, where you can have a voice and it's particularly because there's such a demand for, for resources, there's such a demand for, for news sources. Uh, for example, last year when, uh, so I run the Canadian, uh, Canadian Foundation for HIV Research, for AIDS Research. Uh, last year when Martin Sheen announced that on the Today Show that he was HIV positive, um, the Twitterverse went berserk, the news media went berserk. And uh, so we tweeted out saying that uh, uh, we've got, very good sources of information. If you want an, an angle on this story that is either local or you want a med medical perspective or you want this or that, uh, and, and and our regular, our, our friends, uh, the reporters who are friends came to us right away, but a whole lot of others did as well. So um, uh, using that, and we, we couldn't have done that without social media. That was, uh, we were posting on Facebook, we were doing all of the above, but we were able to get a whole bunch of key messages out um, about the work that we're doing, the work that was relevant to that story, and and to give it another perspective. So anticipation, I guess, and and then and then using resources, social media resources that are our, at our disposal uh, to become part of the story. Yeah, I just want to uh, uh, clarify that's so Charlie Sheen and not Martin Sheen. Who? Oh, I'm sorry, Ch Charlie Sheen, the son of. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, David Meerman Scott calls that news jacking, and uh, he sh shared a couple of really interesting case studies in his book. One that I really liked. Uh, you may remember there was a fire at one of Richard Branson's. Uh, it was his his tropical oh. island resort, yeah. and Kate Winslet uh, happened to be staying there at the time, and so was Richard Branson's grandmother. Uh, elderly and frail, and when the place caught fire, uh, Kate Winslet rescued uh, Richard Branson's grandmother, carried her out of the burning house. And far from this tropical island in London, the London Fire Brigade uh, was trying to recruit women firefighters, 
and they saw an opportunity here and immediately posted an item on their blog inviting Kate Winslet to come in for firefighter training, uh, knowing, of course, that she would uh, politely decline. But it was in, I think, the third paragraph that they pointed out they were trying to recruit 200 female firefighters, and it really boosted the applications. Uh, and, here you, take, and here you are 18 months later telling the story. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I think that's another way that PR people can use social. I, I think it's sad that we're all trying to emulate uh, Oreos with their dunk in the dark from a few years ago with some of the lamest tweets that uh, take advantage of that leverage cultural events and, and news. But, um, you know, uh, speaking of that, though, there were a couple of instances recently, both related to our um, circus of a presidential election here in the U.S. Uh, the first of these was Skittles, when Donald Trump Jr. Uh, tweeted uh, comparing Syrian refugees to, to Skittles, and uh, Skittles issued a statement uh, a couple of hours after that, after they saw that they were being discussed a lot. Uh, the other was during the uh, second, uh, it was actually the first presidential debate, I can't remember if it was the first or second now, but it was when Donald Trump uh, referenced Ford moving a manufacturing facility to Mexico. Both Ford and the United Auto Workers were aware that this could come up in the debate, and they were ready with their responses to this and got them out very, very quickly. So, you know, a couple of instances in which PR or public affairs was aware of their uh being dragged into this conversation and feeling compelled to respond and doing so through social media in order to get that word out broadly and quickly. I think that moves us to the question of reactive public relations. We've talked a lot about when you're trying to pitch or you're trying to put out a press release, but I think that the role of social media is <coughs> maybe even more challenging in a reactive situation because if you have more control pitching a story proactively because of the multiple channels you have, you have less control of your ability to monitor and stay on top of things in a reactive situation because things can happen so fast and come at you from so many directions. So I think that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a current uh, case study right now with this, as long as we're kind of talking about crisis, semi crisis situations. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but on a Delta Airlines flight out of Detroit, a uh, passenger was having a medical problem and they did the usual thing over the PA asking if there was a doctor on board and a, a woman raised her hand and said, I'm a doctor. Uh, she happened to be an African American and uh, was treated very condescendingly and, and told to basically stay out of it. Um, and the doctor who said basically she felt that uh, the crew couldn't really believe that a black woman flying out of Detroit could actually be a doctor, uh, posted the entire thing to Facebook and it went viral. Uh, and people started leaving their comments about this over on Delta's Facebook page and Delta, the first place they posted their response, uh, also the primary venue for their response was their Facebook page. So is, is another instance where social media becomes the focal point of the situation that you're trying to address. Mm -hmm. I think it's also fascinating, uh, Sheldon. We were talking, Alice sort of talked about going back and looking at audiences and messages and all that sort of fun stuff. We have some companies now, I mean, certainly the ones that have consumer aspects where you know, playing in the social media space is absolutely critical to doing things. Um, I think when you still look at some B2B models, maybe not quite as important to do the social media thing. And I think that's one of our roles as communications professionals is to provide that guidance and counsel. You know, you've got some companies, I think of an Airbnb or an Uber, who in a sense, their entire business model is built around social media of you know building the community me knowing you you rating me as a driver me rating you as a writer or you know as a host on an airbnb thing so there are some organizations that just cannot help but be a part of the social media and it's baked into their new business models and others i think are trying to sort of figure out how to 
plug it in with existing things and uh, you know have that beautiful blend that would work wonderfully well for their audiences. So something else that we need to keep in mind is it's not a one size fits all. In fact, it's probably getting a little bit more splintered. And you know, before you just wrote the press release and you know, sent it out, you know, first to your list, you had envelopes and labels if you were really lucky, and then you did business wire because it's much more efficient. And then you just sort of posted it somewhere. Well, now we have to be a little bit more specific. And you're talking about uh, you know, there, there are some instances where something can go viral where it affects everyone, but those tend to be more on the consumer side. Yeah. I, think, I think that monitoring social media is something that is kind of the first stepping stone for B2B companies. I worked for a, a company a couple of years ago that <clears throat> was completely opposed to doing anything proactive in the social media environment, other than the fact that their HR people were posting jobs. And uh, we, we did finally persuade persuade them that they needed to invest in social media monitoring as part of our overall media monitoring. And they discovered that it was extremely valuable. Uh, we did identify one employee who was uh, posting confidential information on his Facebook page um, and uh, got that uh, stopped. Um, and we were able to do a little detective work and figure out who it, 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 he was posting it on another site, but it was uh, we figured out who he was, and uh, and I think if a company sort of gets introduced to it that way, then that can become a bridge to saying you know we need to be putting our own our own spin out there, our own messages, our own perspective, our own personal insights. Um, I'm working with another client right now that's redoing its website site and they're building more social media aspects into that and trying to figure out how to get employees involved in posting social media uh, messages. Yeah, there's there's a competency issue, isn't there, in the public relations space. You you have to start hiring or training people to know how to do these things because there are so many different channels. Uh, I'm aware that there are a lot of companies now hiring channel managers uh, and the whole goal here is to make sure that if you're if you've got a video, you're repurposing it well for the sites that have limits on the time. If you're going to get it on on Facebook, it needs to be captioned because the default is audio off. Uh, but it's also being able to think about those channels when you're planning uh, a public relations effort. For for example, Raytheon. I know uh, when they participate in in the air show, it alternates between Paris and and London uh, year to year that uh, they have a photographer on staff and the photos are getting approved quickly with a lawyer on scene uh, who is able to say, yeah, that one can go and uh, up to Instagram it goes and, and to other channels. Um, and they're writing as much in advance as they can. So when the event happens, they just fill in the blanks and they don't have to worry about long, tedious legal approvals. They, the lawyers already approved the basic content. They just take a quick look at what's been added and it can get posted to Facebook and the like. And as a result, they've had tremendous uptake of the material that they have shared from these air shows. So a lot of social media planning goes into these PR efforts. Yeah. Well, it has to be those, those social media planning has to be coordinated with the overall program. And that's particularly, I think, important in a company uh, such as a law firm that I worked with in Minneapolis for a number of years there were certain segments of that practice where they were very savvy about using social media. Their clients were savvy about using social media. And then there were other sections where um, email was even somewhat suspect and it was still a lot of face-to-face -face and phone call stuff. But we had to build into the plan the recognition that social media worked in some environments and it wasn't going to work in other environments. So we weren't trying to shoehorn attorneys to use social media when they weren't comfortable with social media. Um, good example is the entertainment practice. The entertainment practice was light years ahead of everybody else in using social media. The corporate practice group probably still doesn't use social media much because their clientele just isn't, they may be in social media, but they're not there for business purposes. Mm -hmm. So it, one of the things that I've done is, is, which I'd like to know about the rest of you doing, I've trained and coached clients to do their own relationship building. 
one of the attorneys, for example, probably has more craft brewery clients than anybody in the country. And he's very much tied into good relationships with the brewery trade industry. I don't have those relationships. He already had budding relationships. So he's, he's doing his own thing over there, but he's doing it well. And, and I've helped him learn how to do it well. And then I've let go of it. Yeah. That's good. If they, if they pick up on it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to, it's back to knowing your audience, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I was at a, a media. <laughs> I was at a PR dinner in London a couple of years ago and the speaker talked about the responsibility of the communications industry and that, that, that PR agencies and referring here to the, the larger PR agencies are, are today, uh, part communications firm, part technology firm. Mm -hmm. And the impetus was on the, our industry, our, our, the, the, the people that, that are, are the professionals within our own industry uh, to gain that expertise and to be able to counsel effectively because if we don't do that, somebody else will. And I think that's, that supports the kinds of things that, that you're talking about. Um, we've, we've got to have the, the, the know-how and stay ahead of the game so we can counsel people effectively. Well, I think I mean, we're looking at this whole democratization of the communication profession in some ways, you know, that uh, before we may have had the uh, only keys to the car and we're the ones who sort of insist upon filling it up and we knew the rules of the road, others are now playing in that same space. And I think Absolutely. where one time what we were doing was trying to figure out the, how do we take this old thing that we used to do and apply those same principles to the new thing and, and doing that translation. I'm not sure that some people who are sort of being trained only in the social media and I haven't seen this understand some of those old rules and the, the why behind some of it. They're very great at the what and the how, but maybe not so much the why. And I think bringing back some of that and maybe our role becomes that of the the counselor, the coach, the, you know, stuff, the environment, as opposed to the feeling as if we have to have the hands on to do everything ourselves. So that people can build those relationships. There are being built anyway. They can communicate, which they're doing in email. This is just one more channel. I keep thinking communications people probably never, I mean, at one point we all, oh, you know, how dare they send out memo out inside the company without having checked with me first. But then we realize we don't really want to send out all the memos and get them all cleared, even the ones that are going to all employees. Somebody else can do that. You know, I think the same thing, we never wanted to take over the telephone system and tell people how they could and couldn't talk on the phone or how they should and shouldn't leave voicemails. And we're seeing that applying to things that used to be in our exclusive purview now we need to learn to let go a little bit and encourage people, find ways to teach them, find ways to coach them so that they understand the why they're doing it, the how they can do it, and the, you know, the, the best practices out there. So create that great communications environment and uh, provide that coaching and turn them loose. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, which, which uh, speaks well to a question we got from Priya Bates, uh, our fellow fellow. But before I get to that, I want to uh, get to one more that uh, – Brian shared more of a, a statement, but definitely a question built into this. He points out that uh, a, a public relations practitioner uh, out of Toronto uh, named uh, Jana Schilder uh, has said that uh, she, she isn't wild about the idea of tweeting to journalists because she doesn't want to bug people. Uh, seems to me that you can bug a lot of people by tweeting unwelcome and unwanted material, but if you have built the relationship uh, and and built the trust and they know that what you're going to send them is, is based on your having figured out what they write about and what they're interested in, uh, that's not bugging them, that's helping them. Uh, agree? Again, <clears throat> it's all about the relationship. Uh, and it's any, any more than when we had our smilers, smilers and dialers at the PR agency um, who sat there and, and called reporters all day. It's the same thing. You have to have a, a relationship. You have to have us and you have to have good content that you're that you're pitching. And you also have to be uh, conscious of the preference of the reporter. If somebody says, I still prefer email to tweets, don't tweet them, email them. Yeah. I think we always need to look at it as a different role instead of them helping us do our jobs. It's how are we helping them accomplish their goals? And that requires understanding what it is they're trying to do as opposed to just blasting things in and hoping for the best.
Yeah, I got started in employee communications, and uh, as I got promoted, I was handed media. I had never done it before, even though I had been on the other side. Like you, Marianne, I was a, a newspaper reporter for a daily, um, and uh, I was I was terrified by it. And I, I called Wilma Matthews, another of our fellows, and, and I said, what one piece of advice would you give me? Uh, and, and she said, your job is to help the reporter do his or her job. Um, and, and that was the best advice I ever got in that space. But let's uh, tackle Priya's question, which I actually had written down to talk about anyway, uh, and that's the role of employees in PR efforts and PR campaigns. Uh, you know, more and more organizations are setting up employee ambassador programs to help with marketing, uh, but I don't think that a lot of them have uh, been brought into uh, the corporate or the corporate communications or the PR campaigns, and, and yet they are there. They're informed insiders. The ones who, who join these efforts are engaged employees. Uh, in a crisis, every employee is interested, and because their profiles usually specify the company they work for, their communities may come to them saying, what the hell's going on? Uh, in the social media space, and by the way, there, was a, there have been a couple of studies that find that the overlap between people who follow the brand and people who follow the employees is somewhere between 6 and 8%. Uh, so employees reach a lot of people that the company can't reach through its social channels. So what is the role these days in employee advocacy uh, 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 along uh, the lines of, of, of the PR efforts the company's making? Well, I think it's critical that we help employees have the information they need and the skills back to uh, Brad, you know, talking about be sure that they have the the skills to use that information uh, so that we can leverage it. You know, it's really, uh, I think, a waste of talent to shut those people out or shut them down. As long as they've been through the training and understand the policy so that they don't make things worse instead of better, right? Exactly. And because you can cherry pick those, those people. Um, I can relate it to, to crisis work in particular. Um, my theory is never have a spokesperson talk to somebody they've never talked to before because that exacerbates the crisis. If you've got a CEO talking to an audience the CEO's never addressed, it says that whatever's gone wrong is really terrible. But if you have the per and it may be really terrible, but if you have the person speak to that audience who is accustomed to dealing with that audience, it helps neutralize the severity of a situation. And again, you've got to you've got to be sure those people are trained. You have to be sure that they are comfortable with the messages and that they're on board with the messages so that they can talk to the, the their customers if it's sales or they can talk to regulators if they're people that work in compliance. And it, 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 in, in non-crisis situations, I my experience, the the if there's been an issue, it's been around consistency and accuracy, mm -hmm. and that uh, I can think of one example where where uh, um, a large recruitment company and different regional heads of the company were were uh, part of the ambassador program and and social media program, and and uh, we found that that there were varying degrees of accuracy in what they were putting out. They were sometimes putting their own spin on what they were given uh, or their own interpretation. Some, some, of, some occasionally uh, would, would uh, uh, contradict uh, the position of the, of, the, uh, of the company. So that was one issue that we had to follow and just do some follow-up and training and, and uh, internal relations. Yeah, I remember during the uh, Deepwater Horizon blowout, there was a lot of media criticism over lack of access to people involved in the cleanup. And, you know, most people think it was BP that was handling the, the media response to this. It's actually the Coast Guard uh, called Incident Command. And the Coast Guard officer who was running it, who had previously been commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, said, this is ridiculous. If you've got a guy cleaning up uh, oil on a beach uh, on the coast of Mississippi, there's no reason he can't answer the question, how's it going? Because he's right there. Uh, he said that this was a policy he had implemented throughout the Coast Guard, uh, that if you get a call from the media and the question is about something where you have subject matter expertise, it's about your job, 
feel free to answer it. It's not one of those things where I can't talk to you, you have to call media relations. And I've thought ever since I read that, that if the Coast Guard, uh, which is you know a branch of the US military and, and probably the epitome of command and control, if the Coast Guard can empower employees to talk to the press, uh, just being aware that if it's outside their area of expertise, that's when you forward them to media relations to get them in touch with the right person. Why can't business do yeah. this? What are we so afraid of? Yeah. Well, and there are there are areas in particular that are safe spaces for people to learn in, and community relations is one of those. You know, if you have employees who are out building houses or uh, you know working with kids in schools and things like that, and you encourage those employees to share their experiences on on Facebook and to tag the company and those kinds of things, then people begin to see, oh, yes, this is a positive story. Um, and it's not about what the company's stand on climate change is. It's about what we're doing in the community every day. And, and those become ways that the company on a broader level can become more comfortable with that. I think the other piece to remember about all of this stuff is that employees have real jobs. I mean, some of these people aren't paid to be the social ambassadors. You know, the do guy doing the cleanup on the beach or the gal doing the cleanup is busy doing the cleanup and maybe they don't have time to be sitting there tweeting or taking pictures or posting. Um, so when I look at this, these whole social media training programs, first is it's almost sort of self-selecting. Those who are most motivated will go off and do this stuff. I mean, there has to be like an inner drive to whether they're uh, you know, a software engineer or an accountant, there's got to be something that makes them want to participate in this stuff. And then if you can do the training and if you can provide them information and provided they don't go too off base, as Chris said. The other one that I just found fascinating um, most recently is I've, I've seen a number of companies and, and Cisco is one that's actually turned this into gamification. They're um, awarding points to those people who are part of the social ambassador program. I don't know what the prize is, but you know, sort of like the the more of this stuff that you retweet to your audience, the more points you are, and you can become one of the ones on the leaderboard um, for this next week. So that there is an, not only. Um, training people and helping them, but also this um, encouragement that it's an okay thing to do. We would want to do it. So, yeah. you know, maybe that's a way to get some of those motivated people out there doing things. I'd like to have a discussion sometime about uh, <clears throat> media training in the C-suite and in this whole context of social media and, and uh, uh, in terms of executives and their use of social media, their, how social media fits into media training today. Um, perhaps a, a subject for another day, but, but it, it, uh, it would be. But yeah, you know, I think it's worth mentioning here that Edelman has been very proactive in its support for the idea of the social uh, CEO. Yeah. Uh, there are a number of CEOs who communicate about the job and about business through a Facebook page, not their personal account, but a page they have set up. Uh, Reed Hastings, who is the CEO of Netflix, actually. Uh, shares uh, material information uh, through Facebook. He was investigated by the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission here in the U.S. Uh, and uh, his uh, response to them was, everybody who pays attention to Netflix and the investment community and, and uh, the media knows that I talk through Facebook. And, and the Securities and Exchange Commission came back and said, that's fine. Uh, you don't need to send a press release in order to satisfy Reg FD if everybody who is a stakeholder knows that this is where you're distributing the information and uh, you're starting to see some other CEOs uh, do do the same thing because it's it's a more social engagement. Edelman says we had the celebrity CEO in the, in the 70s um, then we we shifted to the anonymous CEO after after a couple of financial meltdowns but he said they they now really promote this idea of the social CEO Yet at the same time, the Edelman surveys are showing that CEO is one of the least trusted sources, and it's much more that common person. So sometimes the social ambassadors, I think, are as important, or maybe more so than CEO. But I like Chris's idea of having the, you know, what kind of coaching and counseling would you give to CEOs about uh, their social media? Probably the only one I would say right off the bat is don't do things at two or three in the morning. It doesn't seem to be. <laughs> I that's a very, very wise point. 3 a.m. tweet storms don't work well. Uh, well, we're at uh, two minutes left in the show today. So what I'd like to do is go around and, and get your one, I, one thing I really wanted to talk about and we didn't have time for was the idea of paid media uh, because you know, PR is traditionally earned media, but these days boosting posts 
and the like is a big deal. But uh, let's just go around and get your one key tip about uh, PR and social media. We'll go backwards on my thumbnail list. Uh, Marianne, what would you share as your, your one big key takeaway? Not to be enamored with the latest shiny object when it comes to working with the with social media or any kind of media, really know your audience and be sure that that channel is going to reach the people you want to reach. Great. Chris? I think mine would be that it's still about relationships and, and uh, regardless, as Marianne says, of the, of the technology, certainly keep abreast of that, keep on top of that, keep ahead of that, uh, but figure out how you establish relationships with reporters or, or other uh, stakeholders that you need to communicate with. Mm-hmm. We're still right. human beings. Yeah, absolutely. Doesn't mean you need to bring a Rolodex with you, though, right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Brad? Um, having grown up in the Midwest, in Missouri, not too far away from uh, Mark Twain's boyhood home in Hannibal, Missouri, I love the whole Tom Sawyer idea of getting the fence painted. It's like, get others to do the work for you, as opposed to putting it all on your shoulders, see if you can't enlist a team, because uh, you know there's nothing better than getting others to embrace where it is that you're pointing and do some of your bidding. And Alice. Okay, well, they stole all my good ideas, but I one of the things we didn't talk about that I think is important that is a tip is, Think about a social media policy, um, both for how you're doing it in in uh, within media relations, but also how you're bringing others into that conversation in terms of employees, um, in terms of executives and things, and, and help them be, become comfortable by having the kind of policy that says these things are okay. Right. And I would suggest that it's important to inventory the social media and digital skills of your team, uh, because if you have to execute a strategy, but you find the team doesn't have the competencies that they need to do it, you're in trouble. And you know, there's basically three things you can do. You can hire, you can train, and you can outsource, but you need to figure out where those things have to happen uh, before you're in the middle of a campaign and realize those skills aren't present on your team. Uh This has been a great discussion. I appreciate uh, the time from all of you uh, listeners and and viewers. Uh, Watch for an announcement of the November Circle of Fellows and the theme, the topic that we'll address then, and and the fellows who will be participating in that discussion. Uh, Until then, thanks a lot. Have a great uh, day, everyone. Thank you.